Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next academic year of Harvard Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Eileen Reynolds, and I'm welcoming you to Grand Rounds at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and you will meet my colleagues, Katrina Armstrong and Joel Katz, who will welcome you from Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital a bit later. We are all looking for bright spots and silver linings amid the COVID pandemic. Harvard Medicine Grand Rounds is, for me, a big win. In March, our three hospitals, typically highly competitive with each other, began collaborating on what became a weekly combined medicine grand rounds. By making the rounds publicly available and bringing our collaborative expertise to topics on the biology and clinical care of COVID-19, we were able to reach 10 times our typical live grand rounds audience, and the videos have been viewed hundreds of thousands of times. We all hope that, you, that they have made an impact on your patients and in your search for answers to all of our COVID questions. This year, we are moving to a once a month format. While we once hoped to move on to other topics, for obvious reasons, we're now continuing our focus on COVID. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us all today and in future sessions. I'd like to hand things over to Joel Katz from Brigham and Women's Hospital, who will introduce our panelists. Very much, I'm Joel Katz. As mentioned, the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital is honored to participate and to welcome our audience, our distinguished speaker, and our panelists whom I will introduce. We invite the audience members to submit questions throughout the presentation via the word bubble at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists today are Dr. Michael Klompas, hospital epidemiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, professor of population medicine at Harvard Medical School, and at the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute. Dr. Sharon Wright, senior medical director in the Division of Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And the third panelist is Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Not that he needs an introduction, but I would like to invite Dr. Walensky to introduce our Grand Round speaker. She's muted. I have the great honor of introducing a man, truly a hero, who needs no introduction. But for those of you who only know Dr. Anthony Fauci from his appearances, I want to be sure you recognize the scope of his public service was appreciated very long before COVID-19. Dr. Fauci was appointed the director of NIAID in 1984, when I was barely in high school. He has advised six presidents, was a principal architect of the presidential, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, and his scientific contributions in HIV immunopathogenesis has, have ranked him the 41st most highly cited researcher of all time. His awards are too numerous to list, but include the Lasker Award and the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor given to a civilian by a U.S. president. And that was all before he stands as the international face of science and truth in all things COVID-19. Dr. Fauci doesn't know this, but when I first met him years ago, he shook my hand and I walked away and swore, even as an ID doc, that I would never wash it again. That handshake is like the red carpet of infectious disease. Dr. Fauci, we are so privileged to have you join us this morning. Thank you very much, Rochelle. It's really a, a great pleasure to be with you today. Uh, after a relatively uneventful day yesterday in Washington. <laughs> I'm very pleased to join you in a much quieter setting. So as you can see, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It really is, is, is a pleasure to be with you this morning to talk about this obviously extraordinarily compelling and important subject. As you can see from the first slide, I'm going to talk about both the public health and the scientific challenges associated with this historic pandemic of COVID-19. As some of you may uh, have noticed and read, uh, in January of this year, I wrote a viewpoint with my colleagues uh, 
in JAMA, and I entitled it Coronavirus Infections More Than Just the Common Cold. And those of you who know me, I really wasn't trying to be facetious about that, but I wrote it that way to get the readers to appreciate that this is not our first experience with coronaviruses by any means. And again, just to refresh your memory, I know that most of the audience is aware of this, but there are a number of coronaviruses in both animals and humans, the bats being one of the predominant reservoirs of the virus with a number of intermediate hosts. The four coronaviruses that are shown on the slide that are shaded in yellow are the four coronaviruses that are responsible for anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of the common colds which we all recurrently get infected with, usually through the winter months. Then in 2002, we had our first experience, at least to our knowledge, of a pandemic coronavirus with the severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, which has been designated SARS coronavirus 1. And then 10 years later, in 2012, we had the MERS coronavirus, or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. SARS was clearly a pandemic with 8,000 individuals, 800 deaths. MERS is still smoldering, and these are just a slide to show you the time frame of when these appeared. You know, when you talk about what went on before we even recorded it, it is very likely, though we haven't proven it definitively, that the four common cold coronaviruses were at one time in our history pandemic and may in fact have been much more serious than what they are now, which is namely the relatively benign common colds. So then fast forward to where we are right now. Again, everyone familiar with the history of this, at the end of December 2019 and the first week in January of 2020, China had identified yet again another strain of coronavirus, which was felt to be the source of an emerging outbreak of pneumonia that originated in the Wuhan district of central China. So with that as the background, we look now at this new virus, which as you can see from the phylogenetic tree is much more proximal to SARS coronavirus 1 and hence the word SARS coronavirus 2. So to get the terminology straight again, everyone knows this, but for those who are not that familiar with it, the disease itself was designated COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 2019. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the virus that is the cause of this is now designated as SARS coronavirus 2. Well, again, we all, everyone listening and everyone involved in this has experienced the historic situation of literally the explosion of a pandemic over a few months that is exact, that has really gripped the entire planet. When you look at the numbers from just a day ago, close to 30 million cases worldwide and over 900,000 deaths throughout the world involving over 215 countries and territories. Unfortunately for us, the United States of America has been the worst hit country in the world, with the counts being over 6 million reported cases and just short, and by the time I'm speaking with you this morning, it is certainly 190,000 reported deaths. The heat map of the United States shows by state the cases per 100,000. We'll get back to that in a moment as we talk about the evolving outbreak in the United States. This is a very telling slide and says a lot about the lack of success that we have had in containing this outbreak to the extent that we would have wished we did. If you look at the blue line, is what happened in the European Union, which peaked a little bit before we did, but came down to a relatively low baseline in May and June and somewhat beyond, to well below 10,000 cases per day. Most recently, in their attempt to so-called reopen the economy, we have seen surges in the European Union as shown 
by the uptick of the blue line on the right-hand part of the slide. But this is very much in contrast to what we saw in the United States. As you see the peak, somewhat similar in mimicking the European Union, but when it came down to a baseline, the baseline was disturbingly high, hanging around 20,000 cases a day for several weeks to months. And then when we tried to so-called open the economy, particularly as manifested by several southern states, such as Florida, Texas, parts of California, Arizona, and others, we had a dramatic surge in cases. These were associated in many respects with holiday weekends like Memorial Day and the 4th of July. Obviously, we're watching closely what the post-Labor Day weekend will be, but if you look at where it peaked, it went up to about 70,000 cases per day and over 1,000 deaths. We've now come down a bit to about 35 to 45 and some days up to close to 50,000 cases a day. Still an extraordinarily unacceptable baseline if you're thinking of so-called opening the economy and entering into the fall and relatively soon winter season. Now, why did that happen? Why were we so different than the European Union? Not 100% sure, but there are some strong hints. If you look at how much we actually closed the, the, the country, how well did we really shut down? And you compare us to two representative European countries, Italy and Spain. And as you can see from this slide, there are a number of measurements or parameters of whether we truly shut down or not. One of them is visits to parks and outdoor spaces. And look at the difference between the United States in the dark line and Italy and Spain in the others. We did not shut down nearly as much. The same holds true for presence in workplaces. Look at the comparison between the United States versus Italy and Spain. And finally, common things like visiting the grocery or pharmacy stores. Again, the United States did not shut down to the extent that those countries did. You know, I made a comment about this and actually got a little pushback from people in our government till I went back and dug up the data and showed that in fact, we did not close as much as we had thought that we had closed. Okay, so that's the epi. A little bit about the virology. Again, I know this audience is probably quite familiar with this, but for those who are not, it's a beta coronavirus, an RNA virus, having the mutations that you'd expect, luckily for us up until this point, nothing that really has any major phenotypic uh, uh, issues except for maybe the 614 mutation, which actually has a bit to do with the transmissibility of the virus. There are four structural proteins the S or spike protein is the most important, particularly with the receptor binding domain of that spike, which binds to the ACE2 receptor, which is distributed widely throughout the body, upper and lower respiratory tract, GI tract, and now we're starting to see also in the uh, cardiac as well as neurological tissues, something that is now giving us some insight into the protein manifestations of this disease. The cryo-EM structure of the spike protein, uh, which was delineated by people here at the NIH and the Vaccine Research Center, actually is able to very precisely uh, define the receptor binding domain, which in this slide is colored in green, as you could see on the right-hand part of the slide. As I mentioned, the human ACE2 is the receptor for SARS coronavirus 2. This was not news to us. This is something that we knew from SARS coronavirus one, and like virtually every other virus plays a, a critical role in the distribution of the virus throughout body tissues. Moving on to transmission, no secret, a respiratory illness transmitted between people usually in close contact. There was some real misunderstanding about respiratory droplets and so-called aerosolized particles the aerosol and particle physicists that have uh, approached us now have told us that we really have gotten it wrong over many, many years. 
and that particles greater than five micrometers still stay in the air much, much longer than we had thought when we used to say empirically greater than five micrometers, it drops to the ground, five micrometers, it might be aerosolized. We know now that's just not the case. Bottom line is there's much more aerosol than we thought. Infected surfaces clearly occur. The degree to which they contribute to transmission is unclear. The virus is in multiple body fluids. Again, what the role in transmission is unknown. And as we know, animals, both domesticated and zoo animals, can be infected. And yet again, we do not know and doubt whether this is a major source of human infection. This is an interesting slide that I show just for people to appreciate when someone coughs or sneezes, the kind of droplets that go out. But we know now from good studies that just speaking and especially singing, in fact, spews out viral particles that probably play a significant role in the transmission that we're seeing. There are varying risks of transmission depending upon the type and the duration of exposure. Secondary infections are most common in household contacts. We know that from epidemiological surveillance, as well as in congregate or healthcare settings, particularly closed settings. We know the experience we've had with cruise ships. We know prisons. We know meatpacking places the kinds of close settings that are prone to spread infections. There have been well-documented numerous clusters of cases after a variety of social or work gatherings, which highlight the risk through this close contact. And here's just some examples that I know many are familiar with, the now famous Skagit County, Washington choir outbreak, where one symptomatic person infected 87% of the group in the choir. Community transmission reported by the CDC in family gatherings in Chicago and church events in Arkansas. I'm just giving you a couple of instances and reports, but there are now several that have come out. I could probably occupy a considerable part of the talk. Again, we're all familiar with the Biogen uh, uh, situation that occurred where the drug company had a meeting and it turned into a super spreader event. And again, I just want to mention this because there are some confusion in people who are not familiar with this. There really is much more super spreader events than super spreader people. We used to think that a single person may be particularly prone to spreading it a lot. It is much more likely it's the circumstance in which that person is as opposed to anything specific about the specific person. The thing about this outbreak that is very perplexing uh, in being able to track and get our arms around it is the fact that about 40 to 50 percent of the infections are asymptomatic. If that's not bad enough, we know now, and there was some doubt about this until it was really clarified, that it is likely that up to about 50% of transmissions are from individuals who do not have symptoms. And when you think of contact tracing and isolation and getting a feel for the kind of events that spread this particular virus, it becomes very problematic when you put those things together, asymptomatic individuals and asymptomatic transmission. A number of personal preventive measures that we're all familiar with have been effective, diligent hand washing, avoiding close contact, the six foot rule. Again, it's probably more than six foot with the aerosol, but six foot is good enough. Covering of the mouth with masks and cloth, avoid face touching and regular cleaning of infected surfaces. There have been a number of, of meta-analyses that show that this type of an approach by individuals, the physical distancing, face masks, and eye protection are responsible for reducing the risk of infection by a substantial amount in a number of settings. The same holds true for broader public health measures, things like orders for distancing, stay at home orders, the famous uh, shelter in place orders, modification of scheduling or canceling of schools and businesses, bans, legal bans on public gatherings, and a variety of entry and exit travel restrictions, as well as the commonly employed identification, isolation, and contact tracing.
And again, these type of nationally mandated social distancing policies clearly are felt now to have prevented a substantial number of cases and a very significant decrease in new cases. Okay, moving on to clinical manifestations. The incubation period now is really getting very tight in our knowledge of it. The median is about five days. The range is two to 14 days. The clinical presentation is very similar to a flu-like syndrome. If you look at the signs and symptoms that are shown on this slide, it's peculiar, but now it's very well documented that in many individuals, there's a loss of smell and taste that generally precedes the onset of respiratory symptoms. From a clinical standpoint, the thing that's most perplexing to me as a physician is the extraordinary uh, range and spectrum of disease severity, which confuses a lot of people. I'm happy to talk about that and maybe in the discussion of the questions. About 80 plus percent of individuals have mild to moderate disease. About 15 to 20 percent have severe or critical disease. The case fatality rate varies greatly on age and underlying condition. But what we've seen in the United States is that if you are on a ventilator requiring intubation and ventilation, the case fatality is somewhere around 20 percent. The manifestations of severe disease are shown in this slide, the most common being acute respiratory distress syndrome, but there are a number of hyperinflammatory states, and the more we learn, the more we see the increasing recognition of the incidence of cardiac injury, kidney injury, neurological disorders, the hypercoagulable states, everything from microthrombi in small vessels through larger thromboembolic phenomenon leading to acute stroke. And we're all very familiar now with the serious issue of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is now being reported from virtually every place that has a substantial number of cases. The people at increased risk for severe disease are two general categories, older adults. The data are very striking. If you look at this slide and the number of, or what we say the rate per 100,000 population, the, uh, the range from young individuals on the left-hand part of the slide to elderly individuals in the 75 to 85 plus year category is very, very striking for an age difference in susceptibility to serious uh, consequences such as hospitalization. And then there's people of any age with certain underlying medical conditions. And these are some of the conditions that have been strongly associated with an increased risk for severe COVID-19 disease, and those are heart conditions, kidney disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes. We're seeing that obesity is probably one of the most important of the conditions that are strongly associated with an increased risk of severe illness. And then there are others that they say may confer increased risk. I think some of these are not may, but almost certainly, such as hypertension, at least in the experience that we've been following. All of these play a role, but I believe that hypertension is probably one of the ones that are the most important. Interesting, um, when you review the literature, which we have about HIV, it looks like HIV, if a person is treated, viral load undetectable, CD4 count, normal range, five, 600 or so, that apart from the other comorbidities that they have, they don't have any increased risk of serious disease. The increased risk they have is associated with the increased comorbidities that people with HIV have, as opposed to the HIV itself or the drugs that they're on. And again, if you look at people in the population who are susceptible to severe disease, any, any underlying condition, it's about 40%. Obesity is over 30%. And then you have diabetes, COPD. The reason I show this is that you probably know, because it's become public, that there's been some, um, I would say, disagreement among people who discuss this in Washington, not to be named for today's presentation, who feel that one of the approaches may be just protect the people in the nursing home because they're the ones that are susceptible to severe disease, protect them, 
If the others get infected, there may not be a problem. Well, we know that's not the case because there are enough people who have underlying conditions who are not in nursing homes who clearly have a tendency and a predisposition to severe disease. All of the obese people in society, all of the people who have diabetes, all of the people who have hypertension, they're not in nursing homes, but the fact is they're susceptible to severe disease. Okay, quickly, racial and ethnic disparities, another very disturbing issue. African Americans, Latinx, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, again, get what I call a double whammy. By virtue of their jobs, they have a higher incidence of getting infected, and by the comorbidities which they have, they have a higher incidence of severe consequences. The disparities are profound. Again, using the rate of hospitalizations per 100,000 population, look at the upper bar of blacks with 333 compared to the lower bar of whites with 71, a rather striking difference. Okay, diagnostics. Again, we're all familiar. The diagnostics testing this country in general is not done very well with this. We're getting better. There's the molecular test for PCR, highly sensitive, highly specific. Depending upon where you are, take some time to get the results back, are expensive. Antigen tests are now assuming a much greater role, usually for screening, can be done in a scale up, in a high throughput less expensive, and as I'll get to in a moment, some of them are now coming online that are really quite favorable. There's this antibody test that we all know, and we have issues with antibody tests, how long the antibodies last, whether they're neutralizing or not, what the durability is, a variety of issues that need to be ironed out. I think everyone's aware now of the Binax now from Abbott, which is a 15-minute antigen test, very inexpensive, highly sensitive, highly specific, the government has bought 150 million of these and will be distributing these to places like nursing homes, prisons, schools, and other places. There are other uh, things that are online, such as saliva tests and other new fast tests that could be used as a point of care. Okay, quickly, therapeutics. Um, there are a couple of therapeutics that have been approved uh, right now for by EUAs and will soon like, uh, very likely be licensed and have been recommended by the NIH's guidelines panel. I'll get to that in a moment. There are other examples of investigational therapies that are being tested in a variety of clinical trials. Direct antivirals, convalescent plasma, still question marks about that hyperimmune globulin, monoclonal antibody trials, there are multiple ones going on. Immunomodulators, such as inhibitors of cytokines, such as IL-6, as well as a number of adjunctive therapies, including anticoagulation. There have been two uh, interventions that have been shown by randomized placebo-controlled trials to be effective. One is remdesivir, which was shown in a multinational 1,000-person trial to have a significant diminution in the time to recovery in people who are hospitalized with lung disease. In addition, now we're using spin-offs of that by using remdesivir as a control compared to remdesivir plus other things like immune modulators like baricitinib or interferon beta. And these trials are ongoing right now. We have a network of which you guys, as it were, are an important part of it in Boston of looking at a number of treatment trials, including the one that I just mentioned. There's also active two and three, and this is just a picture of, uh, in case you didn't recognize, Janet Woodcock, Francis Collins, and I uh, announcing at a press briefing two additional trials. These are for monoclonal antibodies, and these are the two trials that were actually uh, announced. We have you know, some cautious optimism that monoclonal antibodies may be an important therapeutic for early disease. I think this is important because the remdesivir and the dexamethasone uh, is really one that is um, for advanced disease and not disease that's early on. We need something to keep people out of the hospital. This dexamethasone, a really good study from the UK which showed that there was a significant diminution in mortality, again, in people with advanced disease, ventilated, people requiring oxygen. Of note, there was a signal in this study that showed if you give it early, not only does it not help, it might hurt. 
which is very consistent with our concept of the pathogenic mechanisms that early on it's better to hit the virus and let the immune response and inflammatory response do its thing as opposed to late in disease where the virus plays less of a role likely and you really want to suppress aberrant inflammation and aberrant immunological responses. And again, another meta-analysis study confirmed the steroid study as shown in this most recently published in JAMA. Um, the treatment guidelines panel was started. It's, it, it's a, uh, a panel that's really a living document that gets updated quite frequently with regard to published and pre-publication clinical data to serve as a guideline for clinicians. And you can get to it by just linking into COVID-19 treatment guidelines.nih.gov. And then finally, vaccines, which we all feel is going to be the holy grail and really the intervention that is going to get us back to normal, which we all hope to do. We've established a strategic approach. This is a paper that Larry Corey, John Mascola, Francis, and I wrote in science a couple of months ago, trying to harmonize the trials. We have now six or seven trials that the U.S. federal government is playing a major role in either subsidizing, getting involved in the clinical trial network. Many of you are already involved in that, in which we do a harmonization of a common data and safety monitoring board, common primary and secondary endpoints, and primary immunological phenomenon. And so far, so good, because we now have a number of trials that are going. They're shown on this slide, three separate platforms, nucleic acid, mostly messenger RNA, viral vectors, including chimp adeno, human adeno, VSV, and measles, as well as protein subunit. Look at the upper right-hand part of the slide. Three of these are already in phase three, and as I've said many times, we project that by the end of this calendar year, let's say November, December, we will know whether we have a safe and effective vaccine, and I would say vaccines plural, and if so, and I'm cautiously optimistic that we will based on really encouraging phase one and animal data, but again, with vaccines, you never say never and you never say always, there's nothing guaranteed, we'll just have to see. But these trials are progressing very well, they're more than two thirds enrolled. Speaking of which, the Boston group has played a major role. One of the co-PIs of, uh, of the Moderna study is your own Lindsay Baden, who is uh, again shown here on this slide. In addition, there are others, including the Ad26 that Dan Baruch and colleagues, including Catherine Stevenson and others have been involved with for a really long period of time. So Boston is playing a major role uh, in the kind of effort that we're talking about particularly in vaccines, but also in other areas. Um, an interesting agreement that you're all familiar with where the CEOs of the company made a pledge that they would not push to get the vaccine approved until they really had a significant signal of efficacy and they have had safety standards. And that really is unprecedented for industry to do that. And they did it because there's a lot of talk about trying to rush the vaccine through before the election so that there could be a claim of victory. These company CEOs, I think, were really good. I consulted with them very strongly about doing this. And then there's the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, which uh, was a group that got together to try and put a framework of if we get a vaccine, and during the early time when it's sparse in its numbers, who gets the priority? And it's shown on here, one that you'd expect, high risk workers, and then people with underlying conditions, people who have critical roles in society like teachers and school staff and things like that. And then the third group is people in industries essential to the function of society. And then phase four is finally everybody else. I wanna show this slide which is really a way that people can really get information as to what's going on with the clinical trials, as well as if you want to sign up and be a volunteer for vaccine. And all you need to do is link into coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org and you'll get a lot of information. I want to just show one last slide. And this is my last slide. It's a perspective that my colleague David Morens, Morens and I wrote for Cell. And, and it's really kind of almost a philosophical analysis uh, 
of emerging pandemic disease and how we actually got to this historic situation we find ourselves in right now and all the things of how we perturbed society, the animal-human interface and a variety of other issues which got us to the point where we're vulnerable to pandemics, not only now that we're experienced, but we have a continued vulnerability to pandemics, which is the reason why we must make sure that when this is all over, we fully appreciate and don't forget the lessons learned that we have indeed learned from this. So I'll stop there. And again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. So I could not be more grateful, Dr. Fauci, for you joining us. My name is Katrina Armstrong. I'm the chair of medicine at Mass General Hospital. And I want to add my welcome to those that came before. I will say that you represent for all of us a shining light in what we have gone through over the last years. I trained with Dr. Walensky when you also represented a shining light at the time of the HIV epidemic for me as a general internist. And I will say we have gotten thousands, I just want to be clear, of questions <laughs> that have come in. But amongst those questions, every third one is just sharing their gratitude with you for your leadership, for everything that you have done for us. And so I just want you to hear that first. I will also just take the moment to say that as the chairs of medicine here in Boston, we have a similar level of gratitude for our infection control leadership and for our ID leadership across Boston. I have such gratitude for Dr. Walensky, for the other panelists as we sit here today. So I'm going to start with a question, and what I will do here today is I am going to ask uh, every other question. I will start with Dr. Fauci, um, and then I will start with a different panelist for a different question. But Dr. Fauci, I'm quite convinced that there's not a single question in the world, actually, right now that people wouldn't like you to comment on. I've gotten questions come in about whether people should, you know, do everything in their life, not questions about whether they should get married yet, but pretty much everything else they would like your comments. So please, Dr. Fauci, if one of the panelists says um, something, please, if you could add on at the end, we would be incredibly grateful for your input. Okay. So I'm going to start with the first question from the front line. Eileen, this is from your MICU that I think is sitting there watching the talk today. And I think Dr. Fauci is building on the comment that you made about the variation in clinical presentation. I think for our trainees particularly who are now working in the intensive care units and see some people so sick, but then also see how there can be relatively symptomatic disease. The question that came in was really about does the burden of exposure contribute to that? And what do we know about burden of exposure? But I think people would love to hear your thoughts in general about where we are in the science, whether it's epidemiology or fundamental science, of understanding that variation. And then I will just say to all of the panelists, if you're brave enough to follow Dr. Fauci, we would love your input also on that. So over to you, Dr. Fauci. Okay, well, thank you. Well, th well that's a question in, in which, you know, uh, one of the things that's very humbling about working in this field um, is that there's so many things that we don't know definitively the answer to. Yes, there is an argument that the inoculum to which you get exposed plays a role in what the ultimate clinical manifestation would be. I think that may play a role. I, I'm not ex really quite sure that that's the case. Um, the thing with regard to the variability is, is clearly going to be multifactorial. There likely will be some genetic issues in there, some polymorphisms that we haven't even recognized. The state of immune activation, the state of your ability to respond, it's a very interesting disease because a little, too little immunity is no good, too much immunity is really, really bad. So why does somebody, the, the thing that puzzles me is, is it all immunologic that makes a person become completely asymptomatic? I can't believe that. I can't believe that the 40 to 45% of asymptomatic individuals are asymptomatic because they have an immune response that the other 50% don't. So I'm baffled as that why that's the case. Is it something about the momentum that the virus gets, that it goes from the upper airway to become a systemic? I don't know. Is that the case? And if the case is it, 
the relative expression of ACE2 receptors. Somehow I've got to believe that the relative density of ACE2 receptors in the upper versus lower airway versus other parts of your body play a role. So I feel really uncomfortable with that answer because whenever I wave my hands more than I'd like to, I realize <laughs> that I don't, I don't have a lot of really good data for you. But that's my feeling, that it's multifactorial, likely some genetic aspect, not completely immunologic, and probably closely related to the density of ACE2 receptors. Maybe I'll ask our panelists, Dr. Walensky, maybe you can join on in that because I think what we heard is that we don't know completely yet. So we'd love your perspective and then I'll go to Dr. Klompas and Dr. Wright. So Dr. Walensky, what are you thinking about the variation in the clinical presentation? Thank you. I, um, it's humbling to fo follow Dr. Fauci and say, I also don't know. <laughs> um, but I, I do think, you know, it has, some, it has to have something to do with the person transmitting and the burden of disease and the viral load. It probably has something to do with the host and the recipient um, and the receptor and the density of receptors in, in, in the recipients. And then the uh, proximity of contact and how close that contact is. So I don't have a lot to add, except that I, I, I wholly agree it's got to be multifactorial. Right. Dr. Klumps, I just said that one of the questions about this was about the kind of how you got it. Does it matter whether it was a particular form of transmission? So maybe you could opine about that also. Well, there's a speculation that maybe um, if you have a large inoculum through deep inhalation of aerosols deep into the lungs, that's more likely to set off a, uh, a more severe inflammatory reaction in a, in a susceptible host. So there is that speculation on there, and there's very indirect data from the use of mass and from prior epidemics that, that maybe could be supportive of that. Um, but I think it's still very much in the realm of hypothesis. And Dr. Wright, do you have anything to add? Too much to add to that. I guess putting on my epidemiologist hat, I would say that looking at the data that's been coming out from outbreaks, which are hard to interpret because the isolation precautions we used and the PPE have changed over time, but do seem to show that um, the, the space, the size of the space, the diffusion, the inoculum, um, and how prolonged the contact is, as well as the proximity, are largely um, thought to be playing a role as well, at least for in-hospital transmission. Thank you so much. I think this issue is such on the front, line, front of every clinician's mind right now as we try to advise patients about what to do in terms of both exposure but then the potential severity. I'm going to jump to another issue here that we've had a lot of questions about, which really has to do with this con uncertainty, maybe uncertainty is our theme for our Q&A, about the upcoming potential for second surge and the essentially the overlap there with the influenza season. And so I think the question, and Dr. Pouch, maybe I'll break my own rule and just go back to you as we seem to be willing to have everybody comment as a panel here. The question really is, is there's confusion about whether or not we should expect a worse influenza season or how influenza will play in if we continue with our current, uh, let's say, hygiene efforts around masks, and around hand hygiene. And so the question is, why do we think that there might be a second surge here? And how would that relate to influenza? Is that about human behavior during the winter? Is that about some other form of public health issue? Could you just share what your thinking is about those issues? Yeah, um, let's take COVID individually and then we'll get to influenza. Uh, the thing that that it really every day when I when we get with the task force we go over the data from the night before, and I, I keep looking at that <clears throat> curve, and I get more depressed and more depressed about the fact that we never really get down to the baseline that I'd like. So I, I I'm sure some of you have heard me say that I don't talk about second surges because we're still in the first surge. <laughs> you know, it isn't as if we went way down. I mean, people who read John Barry's book and understand all about influenza that was way up in April, then it disappeared completely in the summer, and then it came back in the fall of 1918 and the winter of 1918, 1919. I don't think we're going to see that. What we're going to keep seeing is as people, and we try to open up, and if we don't do it correctly, we're going to see these surges that we've seen in the southern states, in the Midwest, and now, if you look at the map, 
it's Montana, North and South Dakota, Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa. Those are the ones that are surging. I think as we get into the fall and we do more indoor things, we are likely going to see upticks in COVID-19. Regarding influenza, I actually, you know, I don't know what's going to happen and I'm not predicting, but if you take a look now at what we have said might happen, actually has happened in Australia. And that is that they have had the lightest influenza season in memory. They can't remember a, a season this light. And the reason is they're doing the things that you're speaking about. They're wearing masks, they're physical distancing, they're washing their hands, and they're avoiding crowds. So I would hope that with a combination of everybody who should getting vaccinated with influenza and the public health measures that we do prevent us from having a bad influenza season and we somehow or other for common sense things don't have a massive resurgence of of covid because what i would like to see is keeping the lid on it keeping the baseline down until we get a vaccine and I do believe we'll likely get a vaccine by the end of the year, the beginning of 2021. And I think that's going to be the thing that turns it around. I just think we need to hunker down and get through this fall and winter because it's not going to be easy. We know every time we restrict, we lift restrictions, we get a blip. I mean, it's getting, it's whack-a-mole. If you look, you know, it really is. If you look at the, the sequence of the maps, of the heat maps, it's whack-a-mole. You know, the southern states up, it goes down. You get Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri goes up, goes down. And now we're looking at the Dakotas and the northwestern part. It's, it's really, quite frankly, depressing to see that because you know what's ahead as we try and do that. The real critical issue is now what's going to happen two weeks to three weeks from the day before yesterday with the Labor Day holiday, which is very concerning to me. So I could not um, echo your hopes more that we can hunker down over the next months and make it to a vaccine. And maybe what I'll do now is jump to some of the questions that actually have come in about vaccine, starting with our panelists. Um, but if any of the panelists would also like to comment on anything about influenza, I'm sure one of you um, at, at speaking to our hospital audiences wants to make sure that you tell all of our faculty to go get a flu shot. So feel free to put that out there. Right. But why don't I ask you all just to think a little bit about the vaccine issues. I would say many questions came in about vaccines. What I'm going to start with is actually one mostly about the distribution issues. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty about let's say we get to an effective vaccine, we're comfortable with the data, what are the biggest challenges or opportunities maybe that we're going to face in ensuring that there's actual distribution? And so maybe what I'll do is I'll start with Dr. Walensky to think about that. And then um, maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Klumpus and then see if anybody else can finish with Dr. Fauci here, if you have anything else to add, Dr. Fauci. So Dr. Walensky, as you think about, uh, you know, in the perfect situation, we've got a vaccine, we're comfortable with the data, what are the issues going to be in actually getting that to the people who need it, and how will we do that? It's a great question. So um, I think the first thing is we need the science to get it, as you commented on. Um, I think we need the distribution is not going to be trivial here, um, especially some of these completed phase one, two, and the ones that are in phase three. Um, the, Several of them require two doses. So if you're talking about vaccinating, you know, 100 million people, you actually have to vaccinate 100 million people twice, assuming that there's not efficacy after the first dose. So that's one issue. The other issue is some of them require the, the Moderna and Pfizer require a pretty substantial cold chain in terms of how they get stored. So you, we really are going to need to think through that. Um, in terms of how we're going to distribute distribute these when they need to be stored at minus 70 or on dry ice. Um, and then I think another big issue is sort of trust and what I would call the space of implementation science. Um, how is it that we are going to um, ensure that the people um, of America, of the world, 
trust this vaccine, reckon, and especially in, an, um, in a vaccine-hesitant society at baseline, recognize its efficacy, recognize that it's the right thing to do for themselves and for one another. And then um, how do we distribute it in communities of color, which is probably a different way of distributing it among scientists, which is probably a different way of distributing among essential workers. So I, I think the distribution process and the implementation process we haven't studied in, in massive vaccine efforts that are required, and that's going to be a heavy lift. And maybe, I'll, Dr. Klompas, I don't know if you could add anything to that. I think some of the data is starting to come out saying that acceptance, the preferences or the proportion of Americans who say that they would be willing to get a vaccine is not 100%. And are there things we should be doing about that even now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the major concern. At, at baseline, we're a society where there's a good chunk of the population, ironically well-educated, who doesn't believe in vaccines. And all the more so, I think, the worry is that in the political climate that's now surrounding vaccines, that maybe some of that concern will be elevated in some, uh, in some communities. And uh, right now, I think we're very much in a, in a question mark kind of a zone. We, we don't know, first of all, does the vaccine work? We don't know how well it works. We don't know... Um, what the safety profile is, and we're all sort of aware of this um, this dangling question around this AstraZeneca, a potential adverse event that took place, um, further sowing the, these questions. So I, I think that we, you know, we have to start off by getting clear ourselves on the science. How well does this thing work? Uh, what are the, what is the, the adverse event profile of it? And then as, with every, as we've done again and again, we don't have to do that hard work of trying to get the public to, uh, to, to, to bias and to, to accept this. Dr. Wright, before I jump to Dr. Fauci to share any of his thoughts, maybe you could share a little bit of how you might think about it at a health system level. I mean, each of us sitting here is thinking about how we might try to get our workforce vaccinated or other things. I don't know if you all have started planning or you have other thoughts about what will the health system role be in this? I think that's a really good question and the latest thing that's been keeping me up at night. Um, I would say that there are two big issues which have already been touched on. One is what I'd rather look at as vaccine confidence as opposed to stressing the hesitancy, thinking about ways that we can help, especially in communities that have not been penetrated well with vaccine previously and unfortunately are the same ones at highest risk, how we can make sure that we get vaccine there um, and make sure that everyone feels that this is the best thing to protect our patients and our staff. Uh, I think also, um, thinking hard about the logistics, because it's not just the cold chain issue, but the fact that there will likely be more than one vaccine candidate that we're using. And so not only do we have to track that someone got vaccinated, but that second dose needs to be with the same vaccine. And how you do that across large populations, often with uh, electronic medical records that don't match and is not probably something that doctors' private offices can do. So will this need to be something that's done either at a state level or central vaccination, or at least for a system? So those, are, I think, are the issues I would add. So, and I'll turn to you, Dr. Fauci. One of the, you know, silver linings people have talked about is, will this vaccination effort, if we come together on it, actually allow us to invest in our public health system? You know, maybe the downstream outcome will be that because of this, we will end up with a stronger delivery system. How do you see it playing out for vaccination? Well, I, to your point that you just made, I hope that that's the case. You know, the amount of money that's being thrown into this is really unprecedented uh, and hopefully that it will dawn upon everyone it has but i hope they act on it that we have let our health a local public health system deteriorate over decades and decades that if we had it the way it should be we would be in a much better position to do the kinds of things you're talking about i have a lot of concerns about the vaccine you know right now the issue of supply chain and distribution is being put in the hands of uh, the military, uh, which is fine because they have a lot of experience in supply chain and whatever. But in general, that's a CDC issue. You know, you get the ACIP advises the CDC and the CDC is responsible for distribution during pandemic issues. We're now getting assistance from General Gustav Perna who is one of the two people on Operation Warp Speed together with Monsef Salawi that is now doing the kinds of planning that you're talking about. I'm concerned about getting, as, as uh, Sharon mentioned, the right populations in uh, to get vaccinated because those are the ones that are the highest risk for complications. And yet, 
we are not doing as well as I would like us to see to getting those populations into the vaccine trials. If you look at the distribution, the demographic distribution in the vaccine trials, we again are falling short with African Americans. We have a, a percentage of African Americans that don't even meet yet the percentage of African Americans in the population. And since they have twice as much a risk, theoretically and maybe practically in the clinical trial, you should have twice the percentage of African Americans, which means it would be like 26%. We're not anywhere near there. So I think we have a challenge ahead of us. We have a challenge of everything that each of you mentioned. I agree with completely, but we got to make sure we do get the distribution in a way that is, you know, easy to do, uh, competently uh, executed, but also with an outreach enough in society that we get people who need to be vaccinated, vaccinated. You know, the surveys are disturbing about people who do not want, you know, to get vaccinated and all of the stuff that you're reading and seeing about in the media, about the lack of trust in the FDA and the lack of trust in the CDC, that is really not helpful at all to getting people confident and wanting to get vaccinated. So we have our work cut out for us. I could not agree more. I actually, my first research study ever, Rochelle may remember this, was studying why people did, um, particularly African Americans in Baltimore, refused to get the flu shot um, in at Hopkins Hospital. And I remember that very vividly at the time. And I think we are still in that situation. So I'm going to end now because I know we're close to time with two questions just to tell everybody. So the first question I cannot not ask because it's all over my inbox. And sitting here in Patriots country, Boston is sports town. Everybody wants to know what, Dr. Fauci, you feel about the differences in the approaches to actually running our major sports leagues between baseball, football, basketball. So I'm just going to say that if you have anything and you want to offer any tips, we would love to hear that. And then for all of the panelists, I'm going to start with Dr. Wright, then with Dr. Klompas, then with Dr. Walensky, and finish with Dr. Fauci. We'd like you to share what you see as the lesson, one lesson for our panelists, three lessons for Dr. Fauci that we will take from this experience when we look back in four to five years. So, Dr. Fauci, first to you about, do you have anything to say about Major League Baseball? I can't let you off this, apparently, without asking you about Major League Baseball. So, if you have any comments, please let me know. Yeah, well, you know, Major League Baseball, I think, tried very hard to do it right and to get everybody tested and to have the capability of isolating people, getting them out when they get infected. And they've had some challenges. I'm actually pleasantly surprised that we're still playing Major League Baseball. I'm not particularly happy that the Washington Nationals are in last place. <laughs> that's another story. Um, but I, you know, I, I think the idea of, of a sport in which there's not contact generally, I mean, there's some contact in baseball, but it's going to be really different with football. I mean, football is going to be very interesting and problematic about what you do with football. I mean, if you really want the sport and you're okay with doing it with an empty stadium, you can isolate the players to the extent they want to be isolated and really create essentially a bubble for them. You know, just get them tested and just do the same sort of thing that you would do in a, in a, in a college campus. You test everybody before they come in, and then you intermittently test them. You know, I would like to see sports come back. I mean, psychologically, it's very important to the American psyche. Um, I, I don't want to uh, wax too eloquent about it because I did that a few months ago and I made enough enemies that I got enough hate mail from sports fans. <laughs> so I'll stop there and let's move on to the lessons. <laughs> well, so I would say that I, there's not a person in Boston that doesn't echo your sentiments, I know. And so this is much broader of an audience, but I know that's such an important thought. So I'm going to uh, start, as I said, with the panelists and start with Dr. Wright, then Dr. Klompas, then Dr. Walensky. And I think the questions, we've had so many great questions come in. But I think if I were going to get a theme, as I said, there's a theme of gratitude, but there's also a theme of just looking for your wisdom. As we look forward to the next months, and I think I couldn't agree more that it still feels like we're in the surge. My house staff now call it the slog, not the surge. 
how is it that we're actually going to look back on this time and what what lessons are we going to take from this so we're out of time so i'm going to ask everybody to be as brief as possible dr wright what lesson will you take from this experience what will we have learned I think we're seeing um, a growth of literature, both peer-reviewed and not, at a speed that we've never seen before. And I think where there was a lack of that in the beginning, where there was no evidence, people are quick to jump in with whatever the latest is that they've heard from local experts in places that saw it first. And I think um, not to discount those, but to continue to rely on the basic principles that we all know about disease transmission, and that all of these studies about particle physics and um, aerosols are terrific, but I think trying to see what's happening and how we can apply those in real life, because even PPE, either due to shortages or just the ability of staff to keep up with the way that they have to care for patients during this surge, we need to be realistic in the ways that actually make sense to be good stewards of our supply and protect our staff and thus protect our patients. So I think I've learned uh, even more humility than I had before as a hospital epidemiologist, and um, I think taking the understandable anxiety of all of our, our staff and our patients into account and making sure that we address that while we absorb the science. Dr. Klompas? Yeah, no, I was going to say my, my lesson is, uh, is humility. Um, that what's been remarkable is how much has changed, um, how much has been assumed and therefore and has, has rapidly been overturned. And that uh, what we all, I think, need to appreciate is that what we think is true today might not be true tomorrow. And therefore, um, as we go about saying what we ought to do today, um, that should be lined with that recognition that it might be completely wrong, and that therefore we need to be um, expansive. We do embrace the sort of the, the, the caution principle as we set about um, creating our, our next steps. And I think that's the lesson to then apply to the inevitable next pandemic that we, we face again, is to, to go in there not with certainty, but with humility. Meg, I have to say I've stricken the words that our first pandemic from the department just because I can't face that yet. But let's just, I hear what you're saying. Dr. Walensky, your lesson and then to you, Dr. Fouch. I hope we look back on this time and realize it was the turning point of how we address social determinants of health disparities in care and um, and protected those who, who um, have been lost, lost and underprotected from the healthcare system. Dr. Fauci. Uh, okay, well, th th there are a lot of lessons. I agree with what with, with everyone has said. I particularly want to underscore the issue about humility because the issue of humility really permeates several of the lessons that I'm going to very quickly mention, but, but, but j just a couple of them. Um, one of the things is when you're, in the, when, you're, when you're experiencing an outbreak, don't ever, ever underestimate the potential of the pandemic. We've been through this before. Remember HIV, five gay men, then 26 gay men, then it's only a gay man's disease, and then it's this, and then it's that, and then fast forward a few decades, you have 78 million people that have been infected, and you know, 28, 30 million, 30 plus million have died. Don't ever underestimate as it evolves, and don't try and look at the rosy side of things. Number two, we can do and should always do good, good, ethically sound, scientifically sound research during the outbreak. This idea of throwing everything to somebody because it's desperate doesn't work. It's gotten us into trouble with other diseases. So let's not forget the fact that although you want to get the best intervention to someone as quickly as possible, that there is a major role for ethically sound, controlled clinical trials. We have to do that. The other one is, again, getting back to the issue of humility. We've really got to realize that when, from day one, you don't know it all, and you've got to be flexible enough to change your recommendations, your guidelines, your policies, depending upon the information and the data that it evolves. Because if you look at what we knew in February compared to what we know now, there really is a lot of differences that are there right now. The role of masks, the role of aerosol, the role of indoor versus outdoor, you know, closed spaces. We've just got to be humble enough to realize that we do not know it all from the get-go and even as we get into it. And then finally, the thing that Rochelle mentioned that I am very, very struck by 
is that if ever there's going to be a, a real, a real uh, incentive for us to now make a commitment to address the social determinants of health, it's got to be now. I mean, we've seen it with HIV. I know everybody here has been involved to a greater or lesser degree. You know, we have 13% African Americans and close to 50% of the new infections in the United States are African American. You know, we have 13% African Americans. And now look at the number of hospitalizations with COVID with African Americans and Latinx. We have got to address that. I mean, this has to be a real eye opener for us to do that. And I'm sure there are many more lessons, but those are just a few. Dr. Fauci, I want to uh, add to the thanks you've heard today. Uh, we would love to sit here for maybe five more hours with you in order to get through the number of questions that we have. So I'll apologize to the audience uh, that we didn't get to most of the questions, but you have much more important things to do, and we are so grateful that you are out there doing them than sitting with us for the next five hours answering our questions. Uh, we all really appreciate your presence here today. I'd also like to thank our three panelists who helped organize and bring this session to a reality. And finally, uh, Emily Healy and Bo Tu, who've been helping us from behind the scenes today. We had uh, uh, an amazing uh, audience of over 6,000 people, which definitely sets our Grand Rounds record uh, and proves that Dr. Fauci is indeed the rock star of COVID-19 that we think of him as. What's up right now as a slide is uh, the places that you can publicly access all of our COVID resources and the previous COVID rounds. We will be back on October 15th with another one of our Harvard Medicine Grand Rounds on another COVID topic. And we thank you all for your uh, attention and time today. And uh, again, thanks to Dr. Fauci. Thank you.